He sure is. What a great joy, loved ones, to be with you on this great celebration of the Lord's resurrection. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20. And unlike what we do here on a Sunday morning where we uh, read the passage and then pray and then go right into the exposition uh, of God's Word this morning, I'm just going to ask you that you just bow your heads with me this morning and uh, before we get to John 20, and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that we have been given the opportunity, this wonderful privilege, to come into this, your house, to proclaim the greatest event in human history to proclaim the fact that the dead do indeed rise, to proclaim the fact that without you rising from the dead, our faith would be absolutely futile. Father, we ask now as we gather in this place that you would be glorified as we proclaim this wonderful truth. We pray and ask, Lord, that you move upon the hearts of, of, of both men, women, children, those who may have been given eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand what you would have them to hear this morning. So we just thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Beloved, today we get to celebrate, as I mentioned in my prayer, the greatest event in human history that would forever change the way God views people. Imperative to the Christian faith is the fact of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. If you think about it, if there's no resurrection for, of Christ, Christianity would be absolutely groundless. If Christ indeed had not risen from the dead, our faith, our hope, are as useful as a $4 bill, worthless and non-existent. Along the lines, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 14, which I think some of you heard this morning in Sunday school. Paul says, now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you, among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And even worse than that, Paul says, your faith also is vain. Vain, meaning vacuous, devoid of any advantage or benefit. It is empty, as some of your translations may have. This is why the resurrection from the dead, that's why Resurrection Sunday, or Easter Sunday, as it is also called, even though Resurrection Sunday, I believe, is most appropriate. Because, in fact, that's what we celebrate. Resurrection Sunday is the most important Christian holiday because the resurrection of Christ is the one event that mostly proves the truth of Christ's claim as the Messiah over whom death could not prevail. Again, just like Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verse 24, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power, death's power, that is. Again, going back to the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there is no resurrection from the dead. And if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And get this, Paul says, and you are still guilty of your sin. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if there, our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Beloved, do you hear what Paul is saying here? He is saying that if Jesus Christ did not indeed rise from the dead, then everything that we hold dear, everything that we hope for, our salvation by grace through faith, is absolutely useless. 
In which case, we as Christians are to be pitied more than anyone in the world for to believe in something or someone that is not true is not only sad, but it's outright foolish. And here's where we hear the unbelieving, the atheist, the scoffer, the, the one who says, I only believe in science. That crowd say, well, that's right. To believe in something or someone that is not proven, that remains unproven, is foolish. It's silly. Yet, we remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3, 3 through 8. When he says, I passed on to you what was most important and what has also been passed on to me. Here's what he says is the most important thing that has been passed to him. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture says. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, Paul says, I also saw him. So we hear, see here that Paul is attesting then that Christ's resurrection is indeed a historical fact, a historical event. Now for this reason, those who deny the historicity and the validity of the resurrection are not and cannot be considered part of the Christian faith, of the true Christian faith. Now, it is naive to think, loved ones, that the fact of Christ's resurrection is equally accepted by everybody, by all people. Christ's resurrection is doubted by many who cannot fathom, who cannot mentally conceive of the dead coming back to life after several days being buried in a tomb. For people such as these, the empty tomb in and of itself proves nothing except that a tomb is unoccupied. It really proves nothing. That's why we ought not to be surprised when we tell somebody, rejoice, the tomb is empty. They're going to say, so what? What does an empty tomb prove besides that it is unoccupied? Again, this shouldn't shock us, loved ones, for as we are going to see here in John chapter 20, for Jesus' closest followers, the empty tomb did not have the effect that we think should have had. I find this fascinating. And therefore, this morning, we are going to look at how several of Jesus' closest followers reacted to the empty tomb. Mind you, these are not unbelievers, if you will. These are not hecklers. These are not the ones who were against Christ. These were his inner circle, his closest friends. We're going to see how they responded to the fact that Christ was no longer in the tomb. So in John chapter 20, we see John focusing on the response of four individuals so long with the rest of the disciples as a whole. In verses 1 and 2 and then verses 11 through 18, we will see the response of Mary Magdalene. In verses 3 through 10, we're going to see the response of Peter and the apostle John. In verses 19 through 23, we will receive the response of uh, 10 of the disciples, the remaining disciples, he signed Peter and John. And in verses 24 through 29, we will see the response of Thomas, the twin, also known as Doubting Thomas. So let's begin by reading verses 1 through 4, or 1 through 3, where it says, Now, on the first day, John says, of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark, and saw the stone had already been taken from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. This is the Mary Magdalene. This is Mary of Magdala, out of whom Christ had cast seven demons out, as you can see in Luke chapter 8, verse 2. And in verse 1, we read that Mary came, and as the other gospel account, she came with other women to finish the 
preparation of the Lord's dead body. Understanding that he was buried in great haste, there was not enough time to prepare the body appropriately or rightly. So she and other women decided to get up early in the morning on that first day of the week to go to the tomb, wondering how in the world the stone was going to be removed, but they figured they'll worry about that when they got there. They went to with spices and they went to continue to prepare with the intent to continue to prepare the Lord's body for uh, a most uh, appropriate burial. Now, of this same event, Mark tells us in chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, it says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on that first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us at the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. And yet, then we see in verse 2, the great surprise that awaited them. You see, loved ones, that Mary did not understand, as you can see after reading. Mary did not understand that Jesus' body had not been stolen, but that he indeed had been raised from the dead. Distraught, presumably, she runs to tell Peter, and the disciple whom Jesus loves, this of course being John the Apostle, of the news. He, she has to go tell the disciples. And she starts by going to the leaders of, this, of, of the disciples to tell them that the Lord's body had been taken and that they did not know where whomever took the body had laid him. So she goes and tells Peter and John. Again, distraught. Presumably she follows Peter and John back to the tomb. For if you notice in verse 11, we find her back at the tomb. Verse 11, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting on the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Why are you, who are you, whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, sir. If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. So here we see again how Mary Magdalene responded to the empty tomb. We see that the angels questioned Mary, and we see that this question was a valid one. Mary, why are you weeping? Alluding to the fact that Mary should have known. She should have expected the tomb to be empty. She should have known what needed to happen. Yet, she was agonizing over her assumption that Christ's body had been stolen. And that she and the other women could not finish repairing Jesus' body properly. Then in verses 14 and 15, we see that here Christ, not the angels, notice, repeats the question and adds another when he speaks to Mary, he says, whom are you seeking? Again, another extremely valid question. Assuming that Mary should have known. And we can see in verse 15, beloved, that Mary's genuine grief obstructed the truth of the event. Now, it is true that she should have known better. 
Yet notice how God, notice how Christ responds. Notice responds to her. Notice that he didn't say, Mary, why are you crying? Weren't you listening when I proclaimed that I would rise again? He didn't say that. Look what he says in verse 16. He says, Mary. He just calls her name. Now, it was when Jesus called her name that she knew it was Jesus' calling that overpowered her grief and caused her to now finally see. And you know what, loved ones, what that reminds me of? It reminds me of when Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. Jesus empathized with Mary's apparent unbelief in the resurrection due to her grief over his missing body. Yet when he spoke to her, she knew after believing, she was sent as the first evangelist to the scared disciples that had gone home. My loved ones, please note the difference it made when Mary Magdalene fully realized that Christ had indeed risen from the dead. Mary Magdalene, notice what she did. She went from grieving to rejoicing when she finally saw that it was indeed Christ who was standing before her. So that's Mary Magdalene. Now what about Peter and John? How did they respond? Let's look at verses 3 through 10. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came, following him, and he entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the faith's cloth, which had been on his head, not lined with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in its place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. What an interesting response, do you not think, beloved ones? To see that these men came, saw what they saw, and just went back. Both men went. John the Beloved, apparently younger than Peter, beat Peter to the grave. John did not go in, but rather just saw the linen wrappings there, but did not go in. But leave it to Peter. He could just say, what are you doing, man? Just go in. Peter went in, and he saw the same thing. They saw that the linens were there, undisturbed, and they even saw that the, the handkerchief or the linen, the cloth that had been set upon the face of Christ was laid off to the side, properly folded. You know, it's interesting. I was listening to Alistair Begg comment on this, and he says, you know, many people make a big deal about this handkerchief. You know, it ought not to surprise us. Mary trained Jesus up well. Mary trained Jesus to, to, to make his bed right when we got up in the morning. There's no really big, you know, big reason to make a big deal about it. He just knew his proper duty. When you got up in the morning, he just made his bed, folded it right there, nice and nice and clean. So we see here, beloved, that they witnessed these linen, these wrappings that were there that were without a body in them. Now, please note. That John is making the point when he says that in verse 8, that he saw and then he believed. Notice that John is making the point that he didn't believe that Jesus was no longer in a tomb until he saw with his own eyes the linen lying there with no body in them with the face cloth nicely folded on the side. Now this is important, loved ones, because the point that I believe John is beginning to point to, to his readers, is that even as an apostle, he did not believe until he physically saw evidence. This is an apostle. At this point, I think it's fair to wonder, Peter, John, 
Weren't you listening? When in Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 to 23, it says, And while they were gathered together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. Peter, John, weren't you listening? When in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, it says, And he began to teach them and the son, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Peter, John, weren't you listening? When in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, it says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Or how about this? Psalm 16, verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Should not the apostles have known this? Yes, of course. But let's keep in mind, loved ones, they were scared. Their leader was gone. And they very well could have been next if the Jewish leaders had their choice. Now look at verses 9 and 10. Notice how even the Apostle John admits that even after a long period of teaching by Jesus, the disciples still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to be raised from the dead. Now I don't know about you loved ones, but this boggles my mind. And why in the world would John admit to this? They were amazed, surely wondering where Christ's body was, not knowing what else to do. What did they do? They just went home. They just went home. How sad is that? Here you have the greatest opportunity to participate in the greatest sunrise service that could ever happen. Yet Peter says to John, I can't understand this. Let's go home. Can you understand? No. Let's go home. Okay, so that was Peter and John's response. Now let's look at verses 19 and 20 and see how the other disciples reacted when they realized that Jesus was no longer in the tomb. Notice what it says in verses 19 and 20. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Here we have Jesus appearing to the rest of the disciples who were behind locked doors because they were afraid. If you were Jesus, knowing that they should have known, that they should have listened, that this was to come to pass, how would you have felt if you found these men that you handpicked To be the man upon whom the church would be built. And find them cowering behind locked doors. And in so doing, proving that they really didn't believe that Christ would rise from the dead. So it is sad, beloved, that the text must lead us to believe that neither Mary Magdalene nor the disciples expected Christ to rise from the dead. But yet, notice notices Jesus' kind response to their amazement. He didn't say, gentlemen, please, what a shame. Did you not believe what I said? No, he didn't say that. Notice how he, he responds to them. He says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Similar to the way he showed kindness to, to Mary when he didn't rebuke her but just simply gently called her name. Again, one must ask, gentlemen, why are you so surprised? 
Why are you afraid of the Jews and hiding like cowards? Do you not remember what Christ told you earlier when he said in John chapter 16, verses 20 and 22, Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Verse 22, therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. They didn't remember that. But yet we see what a savior we have that he didn't rebuke them. He just said, peace be with you. Christ understood their surprise and he didn't rebuke, but granted them peace. Again, what a glorious reunion, except for one disciple. Let's look at verses 24 and 29. Oh, 24 and through, through, 20, through 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here for your hand, reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Now, Thomas is probably one with whom many of us would identify. You see, Thomas was not a pushover. He was a realist. He was a realist. He required evidence, just like many do today. Show me the evidence. Now, if you're a skeptic, I'm sure you can relate to Thomas. And you know what, loved ones? I thank God for Thomas being a realist, being a skeptic who was there to do a reality check for us. Yet to Thomas, notice what Jesus says in verse 29. Because you have seen me, have you believed, Thomas? But he says, blessed are, they who not, who, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Loved ones, let us not forget that the Apostle John here was writing to people that had never seen Christ. They had never witnessed the risen Christ. Like you and like me, these people could not physically see, speak, or, or touch Christ at the time that John wrote his gospel. Now, please don't miss this, loved ones. This is the entire point of this entire chapter, of, this, of, of chapter 20. And in fact, of the entire gospel of John. Here, it, 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 John the apostle points to Christ's call for believing that is not based on physical evidence but rather on faith. Look at verse 30 and 31 where John says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you may have life in his name. Now here, loved ones, I agree with commentator Borchert, who says, the entire gospel of John itself is intended to engender such belief that is parallel to that of the early witnesses without the benefit of tangible evidences. Now, a similar idea is expressed in the introduction to 1 Peter chapter 1. In verses 8 and 9, where Peter says, And though you have not seen him, Peter says, you love him. And though you have not seen him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexplicable, inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. It took the appearances of the risen Lord himself to convince most followers that the resurrection was a reality. 
But yet here the Apostle John, through Christ's interaction with Doubting Thomas, skeptic Thomas, realist Thomas reminds us, listen, those who believe who have yet not seen are blessed. So we saw the response of Mary Magdalene, of the apostles. But here's the good question for you. What about you? How will you respond to the fact that the tomb is empty? How will you respond to the outlandish claim that Christ is not dead, but very much alive. Sure, those in John's gospel had faith based on evidence. Sure, they could see the grave clothes. They, can, they, they knew the body of Jesus was not there. But what about you? There's no evidence for you to examine. There's no grave. There's no grave clothes. No body to see or to touch. Even though... Some tour guide will probably take you to some tomb. Don't buy it. Don't believe it. Buy a souvenir and go home. All this is true. But I tell you that you and I having a greater, we have a greater witness. We have the record of the word of God and that record is true. All of it. Not just the gospel of John, but from Genesis to Revelation. All of it is proof positive of the message of the cross, of the message of the resurrection, of the fact that Christ indeed is the Messiah who came to live a perfect life, to die on a Roman cross, only to rise again, proving that Satan has no power, proving that death has no power, and rising as the first fruits, as evidence and guarantee that you and I will also, as we place our faith in him, will also one day rise again. In glory, imperishable, to spend eternity with him. Peter made it clear that the word of God, not personal experiences, should be the basis for our faith in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 to 21. Now you might be saying, preacher, why the emphasis on the empty tomb? Why the emphasis on believing in a person that we cannot personally prove died or rose again? Here's why, my friends, here's why. John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will have even, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? I'm not asking that. Jesus asked that. Why is this so important, friends? Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and get this, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why is the resurrection so important? Loved ones, because without the resurrection, our futile belief in, in, in salvation is foolishness. It is the resurrection of Christ from the dead that validates our faith, that validates our hope, and that we will one day be saved with him forever. Now, the reason the resurrection of Christ from the dead is such a big deal is because, as I stated in the introductory uh, comments of this message concerning the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, and I'll repeat, and if there is no, resurrection from, the, if there is no resur resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. Now get this, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still in your sins. In that case, Paul says, all who have believed, all who have died, believing in Christ, are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. This is why the resurrection is such a big deal. For without it, Satan won and death prevails. For without it, we have no hope of heaven. Without it, we have no assurance that our sins have been forever forgiven. Without it, this church, this gathering, our singing is absolutely useless and an absolute waste of time. We're just wasting our time this morning if Christ indeed had not risen from the dead. There is no greater event in human history than the resurrection of Christ from the dead. That's where you and I are here, and I suggest to you that that is why you are breathing this morning. It is because of what happened 2,000 years ago. Now, I like how Dr. Wisby 
shares this wonderful story of a Dr. W. Dale, a preacher in Great Britain, one of the leading congregational pastors and theologians. Dr. Dale was one day preparing his Easter sermon when a realization of the risen Lord struck him with new power. He says, and I quote, Christ is alive, he said to himself. Alive, alive, alive. He paused and then said, can that really be true? Living as really as I myself am? He got up from his desk, as many preachers do, to take a mental break and just to ponder about what we're reading and what we are to say. And he began to t walk about the, the study, repeating, Christ is living, Christ is living. Dr. Dale had known and believed this doctrine for years, but the reality overwhelmed him that day. From that time on, the living Christ was the theme of his preaching, and he had his congregation sing an Easter hymn every Sunday morning. Quote, I want my people to get hold of the glorious fact that Christ is alive and to rejoice over it. And Sunday, you know, is the day on which Christ left the dead. That's how important this day was to him. Even an experienced pastor and theologian and teacher, it gripped him with great newness. That's why we are here this morning, loved ones. Now, friends, it is true. Historical faith says Christ lives. He rose again. 500 witnesses, the account of people who, uh, who admitted that they didn't understand. Historical faith says Christ lives. However, saving faith says Christ lives in me. Huge difference. And here's the question. Do you have saving faith? How will you respond to the empty tomb? To the fact that Christ lives? Is he your Lord and Savior? If you've never placed your faith in Christ as Lord and Savior, we invite you to do so today. Come to Christ. Don't ignore the empty cross, the empty tomb. Don't reject the evidence of the witness of God's holy word. Without appropriating the reality of the Lord's resurrection for your life, you are still and will forever remain in your sin. Come to Christ. How do I do that, preacher? Simple. Acknowledge the fact that the word of God is true. Acknowledge the fact that the truth of the scripture condemns you as a sinner. Repent of your sin. Ask Christ for forgiveness, knowing that he is willing and ready to forgive you and go to Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day in which we get to celebrate the resurrection of your son, your only son, whom you said sent to live a perfect life so that he would be arrested and suffer at the hands of your enemies, ultimately to be put to death and buried. But Lord, we thank you that today we get to celebrate the fact that you, Lord Jesus, did not remain dead, but in fact rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. Thank you, that it is because of that fact we can rejoice. Thank you that our faith is not useless. Thank you that our hope is not useless in that in your resurrection we have the assurance of our salvation and our hope of glory. Oh Lord, bring those who do not yet know you to your fold, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.